fresh troops landed on the shores of Masan, South Korea. With barely a moment to catch their breath, they were thrust westward, tasked with defending the Pusan perimeter, the final bulwark against the inexorable advance of the North Korean forces. That summer in 1950, the American military gathered as many men as they could muster, trying desperately to stem the communist tide. Yet, even the might of 140,000 American soldiers struggled against the unyielding porosity of the North Korean fighters, whose numbers were notably fewer, falling short of 100,000. But as the sheer volume of American forces congregated at Busan, a steely determination gripped each man. This was the farthest communism would ever go. Yet, marching along the road to Jinju, an ominous threat lurked just beyond their sightline. In the hills, North Korean soldiers lay in ambush, eyes keenly trained on the approaching Americans, prepared for the perfect moment to strike. And then, with a chilling suddenness, they unleashed a barrage of gunfire upon the unsuspecting American soldiers. A disastrous start. In June 1950, in an aggressive move, the North Korean People's Army, or KPA, invaded South Korea, taking the Republic of Korea Army, or ROKA, by surprise. The South Korean defense was unprepared for such an attack, and the war was off to a disastrous start. The North Koreans had a guerrilla warfare approach and quickly proved their mettle by easily overcoming their poorly equipped and disorganized counterparts. With their superior numbers, the KPA advanced through the country, destroying isolated resistance from the ROKA. It reached the capital, Seoul, in just four days. Though the ROKA retreated, they still continued to resist. But the North Korean troops were well-versed in nighttime attacks, mountain warfare, and hand-to-hand -hand combat, and used their battle techniques to inflict heavy casualties on their enemy. The United States responded to the invasion and presented the problem to the United Nations, which demanded an immediate cessation of hostilities and the withdrawal of North Korean forces back to the 38th parallel. The U.S. sent air and naval forces to aid South Korea and eventually committed ground units to the conflict. Other members of the United Nations also sent contingents to Korea, and General Douglas MacArthur was appointed as the first UN commander. Lieutenant General Walton H. Walker and his 8th Army were responsible for all UN ground forces. General MacArthur had to commit the bulk of his ground units in small groups to slow down the KPA's advance. Over time, the U.S. and ROKA defense lines were driven back to a narrow perimeter around the port of Pusan. First Order of Business The task of defending the Pusan perimeter was monumental. The area was too vast for a dense defense line, and the troops arriving had little combat experience and no familiarity with the Korean terrain. With meticulous planning, General Walker assigned the positions of every unit, the South Korean Army would defend a large line in the north and northwest, while the 1st Cavalry was responsible for an 18-mile line along the Naktong River. The 24th and reinforced 25th Divisions were deployed to defend the line south to the Korean Strait. Initially, it seemed as though the 8th Army could easily defeat the North Korean People's Army. The first order of business was to stop the North Koreans' drive down the western roads leading to Masan. General William Keane, in charge of the 25th Division, launched a counterattack on August 7th. As American forces marched between the two cities, North Korean troops lying in wait in hills above the road launched a ferocious surprise attack and rained down a hailstorm of bullets. Despite having seemingly all the advantages, the counterattack ultimately failed. Several factors contributed to the loss, including scorching temperatures that caused many soldiers to succumb to heat exhaustion. In contrast, the U.S. Marines, in their first highly publicized fight in Korea, performed exceptionally well. They were not only seasoned, but also brought air support and good weapons and ammunition. However, even their support was not enough to overcome the North Koreans' advantage. The enemy engaged the Americans in a fierce battle, later known as Bloody Gulch. By the end of August, the Masan Front had reached a stalemate. Every Available Man the North Koreans had gained ground, but were stopped in their tracks by the tenacity and bravery of Keane and his comrades. Their courage prevented the enemy from advancing further toward Pusan and bought vital time for the UN forces. Under cover of the US Air Force, they launched a massive mobilization effort, destroying bridges and roads and streaming military hardware into Pusan. Yet, the North Koreans remained undeterred, breaching the line at the Naktong Bulge 
and attempting to cross the Nakdong River. But the UN commanders would not be defeated easily. Every available man was sent to the front lines, including non-combat engineers, who would typically be building bridges and manning radios. The Marines were called in, and several new army regiments joined the fight. On August 17th, the Marines launched a counterattack at Opnong Ni, where the most savage fighting had been taking place. The Marines attacked with their Corsairs, strafing the North Koreans with machine guns or cannon fire from the low-flying aircraft. Under heavy enemy fire, the infantry climbed the hills, and after being repulsed, made a combined effort with the army regiments and shattered the North Koreans. The North Koreans were now fighting a different kind of war, so they prepared for a renewed strike. The Bowling Alley As the headquarters of the 8th Army and the seat of the South Korean government, Taegu was a crucial target for the North Korean People's Army. In mid-August, the ominous news arrived that the enemy was set to strike. With the ROK 1st Division outmatched and outgunned, the fate of Taegu hung in the balance. The North Koreans pushed past them and marched towards Tabu, just 15 miles north of the city. Another division outflanked the ROK 3rd and threatened Taegu from the rear. Yet, the defenders of Taegu did not yield. For weeks, they battled valiantly along the treacherous Bowling Alley Road, trading blows with the enemy in a desperate struggle for survival. Despite the odds, the U.S. 9th Infantry Division dared to strike at the heart of the North Korean command post, only to be met with a deadly ambush. As the fighting raged, the North Koreans fired mortars into the city, sowing fear and confusion. The South Korean government prepared to evacuate, but the UN forces held fast, and unleashing a torrent of fire upon the enemy. Through sheer grit and determination, the UN forces held their ground and repulsed the North Korean advance. Taegu would stand another day. No surrender. As the summer drew to a close, the war entered a critical phase. The North Koreans, too weak to continue their onslaught, were determined to press on despite their dwindling resources. Intelligence from the Soviet Union informed them that the UN forces were building up along the Pusan perimeter, forcing them to conduct an offensive soon or forfeit the battle. Flanking the UN forces was impossible, so the KPA launched a frontal assault, determined to break through the perimeter at all costs. Preparing for Operation Chromite, UN troops were caught off guard by the ferocity of the attack. The KPA made appreciable gains, pushing the UN forces back and forcing them to rely on their mobile reserves for strength. General Walker knew that he had to act fast to prevent a complete collapse of his forces. He deployed all his troops to the trouble spots, particularly the Nuktong Bulge, where the KPA had penetrated the deepest. He even called for help from the Marines, who were on their way to embark on the attack at Inchun. In a desperate counterattack, the UN forces fought tooth and nail, inching towards the ridge at Upnong Ni. But just as victory seemed within reach, the Marines were ordered to withdraw, leaving General Walker to fight on alone. The UN forces were in dire straits. The 8th Army and ROK moved their headquarters elements from Taegu to Pusan to avoid being overrun. They were preparing to retreat to a smaller defensive perimeter called the Davidson Line. General Walker knew another withdrawal was inevitable, but refused to give up. He made the difficult decision to hold the line, risking everything to ensure the safety of his troops. A Line in the Sand As the war raged, the tide began to shift. The North Koreans, in their arrogance, made a fatal error. They dispersed their forces too thin along the perimeter, leaving themselves vulnerable to an onslaught by the ever-strengthening UN force. The invaders were beaten back with a ferocity that left no doubt in anyone's mind. They would not be able to move beyond the Pusan perimeter. General MacArthur seized the moment, orchestrating a counterattack with the arrival of US reinforcements and the reorganization of ROK troops into battle-ready units. With the KPA troops caught off guard and exhausted after 15 days of fierce fighting, the UN forces launched a daring assault on September 15th, landing behind enemy lines at Incheon. The remaining KPA forces were forced to retreat, fearing complete isolation if they did not. Despite isolated resistance, the UN forces launched a full-scale breakout offensive on September 18th, relentlessly pursuing the retreating KPA units to the north. With this decisive victory, the fighting around the Pusan perimeter ended for good. In a stroke of strategic brilliance, army and marine forces landed at Incheon in mid-September, quickly recapturing the capital of Seoul. The 8th Army broke through the North Korean ring 
and raced north to link up with the amphibious attack. Sergeant Roy Aldridge later reflected, quote, If we hadn't held the lines at Pusan, there would be no South Korea today, none. We drew a line in the sand that said, no, you're not going any further. <laughs>